Hello, this is Dr. Dan Guerra again from Vera Med, and I'm really happy today to be able to present to you a very interesting new lecture on a specific complementary and alternative medicine. So, you know, we've been talking a lot about disease states, about pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics, of uh, various kinds of therapies that are being used for diseases. We've talked about aging. Uh, we've examined uh, mechanisms, and we've also looked at theories and hypotheses related to various associated molecular sciences and medical concerns. Today, we're going to go to sort of the roots of where Verabmed started, and that is to take a look at these complementary and alternative medicines, these things that are sold over the counter, OTC, nationwide, and of course, um, in fabulous array on the internet, so that anybody basically can purchase these things with a credit card. Um, I want to talk today about a very specific one, and uh, it's one that has been used apparently. It's somewhat exotic, but enough people have um, purchased this and have uh, considered this as a valuable resource, um, perhaps in inappropriately, and I want to talk about it. So here we go. Plus, of course, I found a paper uh, which is going to allow me to uh, discuss it. So let's get back to the beginning here. <laughs> All right. So again, I'm Dr. Dan Guerra, and I'm really glad to talk to you today. So this is Vera Med, and what we're going to do is we're going to talk about this uh, organism here, uh, this blue scorpion, a very exotic subspecies of this blue scorpion that's found in Cuba. So the background here is Cuban jungle. The scorpion uh, makes its home here. And the venom from this scorpion is what we're going to talk about today as a complementary and alternative medicine, presumably for treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, that is a topic we've talked about in the past and we will continue to talk about because it's a major disease. So let's get started. And again, this is September. So uh, happy September to all of you. And this is 2017. Again, what is Vera Med? Um, it, we are scientists verifying published evidence in biochemical, physiological, pharmacological, and general medical sciences. That is our uh, email address. Please contact us directly via that email. You will be in direct contact with me, and I would be more than happy to answer your questions and engage you in an in-depth examination of uh, whatever you might be interested in in science, particularly the biochemical, pharmacological, uh, and physiological sciences, as they are associated with your interests. And they can include medicine, and they can be outside of medicine as well. But that's the basic ingredient for our, our uh, company. So again, nice pictures here. And up there at the top, you can see where I got the image. This is a scorpion, and I'm going to talk to you today about scorpion venom as a complementary and alternative medicine in hepatocellular carcinoma. Okay, so let's get started. Notice I'm wearing blue today uh, in honor of the blue scorpion, and also because I do like the color blue, which is, like, of course, obvious. All right, so let's get some background here. Complementary and alternative medicines, we'll just call them CAM from now on, are non-conventional medical, nutritional, and lifestyle healthcare therapies. Okay, that's a big mouthful, lots of adjectives in that uh, sentence. Uh, but basically, that's that encapsulates what CAMs are. Um, about 50% of Americans use some form of CAM. That's a lot of people, but that's over 150, about probably 160 million people. And it's being used by elderly, by middle age, by young adults, and even by uh, children uh, as given by their parents. These are things that are readily available, again, online or at your local drugstore or even probably department store like a Walmart. Cancer patients are people who are always interested in new therapies for their progressive disease, right? Uh, cancer is uh, one of the number one causes of death and morbidity in this nation and worldwide. So a lot of people are always looking for alternatives even to their own 
uh, pharmacotherapies or surgeries or combined efforts uh, with chemotherapy and radiation to combat cancer. So one of the things that people look for, both uh, usually patients, it started from patients, but also sometimes from uh, their interaction with their physician and their medical staff, um, alternatives. So cancer patients who have, who have been on chemotherapy and or are not responding to conventional medical treatment are the ones you know, you know are going to be really drawn to camps, right? Because they're going to be looking for something that's going to benefit whatever therapy they have and maybe um, find a cure. CAMs uh, have not been carefully examined at the basic research or clinical level. This is an absolute uh, understanding that you have to possess. They are not like the pharmacotherapeutics that we use, or surgeries, obviously, or any of the other medical treatments or therapies that are involved uh, in controlling or in um, remitting cancer. CAMs have not gone through that sort of scrutiny. They have not been vetted. And I think today you'll see why that's so important. CAMs may be biologically potent, uh, or they could be inert, uh, and their interaction with prescribed pharmacotherapy is not studied. So there's all kinds of different modalities we're thinking about here. So uh, we're not saying that CAMs are um, not uh, biologically active. Some of them can be very biologically active. In fact, some of them actually have therapeutic value, like resveratrol, um, the uh, polyphenolic compound which we've talked about in previous lectures. But uh, it, by and large, CAMs are quite a complex, varied amount of organic compounds and sometimes inorganic compounds. And so you can't lump them all together and say, well, yes, because one CAM has been well vetted and well studied and has potency at this level, this dosage, um, this uh, prolonged use uh, record, that all CAMs are that way. It's just not the case. So. Not only can they be very potent, they can also be completely inert. They can have no activity. And then you have to consider what placebo effect they may have. And placebo effect is a real thing in medicine. It's a real thing in all aspects of science. Placebo effect really does occur. And this is because uh, the mind is not neutral in cure. The mind is uh, an active component in how people become cured. And I think uh, this is a a general understanding from psychology, but it's also a very clear uh, and well-documented, um, verified, evidence-based um, understanding from the uh, published research. So placebo effect can also be driven, driven and derived from CAMS. It's not something that we should um, just brush off. Uh, the other important thing, of course, is that there's an interaction that can occur with multiple CAMs or one CAM with any medicines you may be taking or lifestyle changes, nutrition, for example, or exercise, which are further complicating whether or not CAMs have any effect at all or have tremendous effects. Maybe negative, maybe positive, maybe neutral. Uh, pharmacokinetics, dynamics, and general dosing of CAMs are likewise largely unexamined. You can tell that from the earlier discussion I just gave you, uh, or at least they're under-evaluated. So maybe they've looked and looked at, maybe by the vendor that's selling them, or maybe by occasional publications in referee journal articles. But by and large, there's nowhere near this sort of scrutiny that CAMs, uh, that, that normal pharmacotherapies have, that CAMs um, luxuriantly do not get afforded. And this is uh, one of the reasons that they could be sold so often. And plus, they're not regulated, as we'll see in a minute, at least not in the United States. In response to those deficiencies, though, the National Cancer Institute, specifically, I'm, I'm talking about CAMS and cancer today. We could talk about CAMS and any other possible disease, stage, or syndrome. But in cancer, the National Cancer Institute, the NCI, and the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, which is the NCCIH, have begun actually funding some clinical trials for CAMPs. So this isn't something that is, is going to be continued uh, to be neglected. It's something we're, going, we're starting to look at, and you're going to see more and more publications. Now, let's talk about science for a minute, just in a general level. Uh, this was a topic of a couple of things I wrote on my Facebook page, and I recommend that you take a look at the Facebook page, and please respond, like the Facebook page, and let me know what you think of what I've been posting there. Um, so let's, let's, let's go back a little bit. Let's step back a couple of steps and take a look at what we mean by research science. And this is very important to be able to take uh, into account when we're discussing camps. 
Research science depends upon precision and accuracy, okay? And therefore, it is quantitative, right? In general, CAMs and their use are not currently at the level of a quantitative appraisal, quantitative appraisal for classical pharmacological therapies or clinical trials. We just are not quantifying what CAMs are doing. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, let's go back to the simplest reason. It's because we don't really know all the very often what are the biologically active components in CAMs. And if we don't know what they are, uh, how can we quantify them, right? How can we do any dosing? <clears throat> so CAMs then are still largely at the level of qualitative analysis. So right away, red flags or maybe blue flags are brought up because that means that we're out of the realm of basic research science. If we're not quantitative, we're not really talking about uh, verified evidence in research science. We're not at that level. We're at qualitative level. So because of the lack of federal oversight, the vast majority of CAMs for use in humans in clinical trials are just simply not on offer, right? So we haven't had the kind of federal off oversight, so there therefore is no funding for it. Let's take a look at some of these laws, just very briefly. Um, sometime in the future, I'm going to go through how research is done in this country and talk about clinical trials, how they're performed, the biases that are sometimes found in them, and the biases even in funding, and, and also how evidence is played out for the general public uh, versus the scientific community. But right now, I'm just going to give you a brief look, a very small little look at, at what we're talking about here for CAMS. There is the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994, and it provided definitions and guidelines on dietary supplements. So manufacturers are generally not required to provide safety, efficacy, or standardization to the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, as they are with prescription or non-prescription drugs. So flat out, okay, full stop. CAMs fall into this into this general understanding of dietary supplements uh, because they're alternative medicines. They can be found in crude extracts. They can be found in plant leaves, right, or roots. So they fall into this general category. So the FDA may only review false claims, advertisements, and other kinds of uh, on-offer um, testimonials that you might find on the Internet, like, for example, on YouTube or something. And they can monitor safety of dietary supplements that way. But you have to be able to really show that there is a false claim. So the FDA isn't looking at everything all the time. So the Dietary Supplementary Act, the DSHEA, again, basically tells you that there's, you know, the FDA is not regulating these supplements, okay? Just not like they would for a lot of other things. So right away, you understand that you're on your own here. Now, Preclinical studies are conducted first in any kind of research that's going to end up in the clinic. It's going to end up as a medicine or a therapy for humans. You start with preclinical research. Uh, and this is certainly the case with pharmaceuticals and any kind of medical practice like a surgery. Say. And um, they're performed first on cells, tissues, and then, of course, experimental or model animals, mice, lab mice, rats, sometimes guinea pigs, sometimes ferrets. There's always an experimental animal between uh, what's going on at the lab bench and what ends up hitting the clinic. Way before it gets to the clinic, experimental animals have been well uh, used to study uh, medical therapies, practices, and medicines. Okay? So only then, after all of that uh, uh, preliminary work, do they make it to the clinical trial. This is not the route that's taken for CAMPs. Okay, CAMs don't end up in a laboratory being studied for years in cells and culture or on a petri dish um, or, or in animals even, uh, like in, in lab mice. They're just not uh, looked at at that level of scrutiny because all of that takes a lot of money, a lot of resources, a lot of research, a lot of hypothesis-driven science. And they're just not being focused like that because they might just be able directly from who's ever manufacturing them and claiming them to someone's doorstep because they bought them online. Right? So that's quite a bit different. So let's take a look at what clinical trials normally do. And you can see where I got this from, directly from the federal government. So, so there are different phases in clinical trials. And none of these 
by by and large are being uh, used or expressed for CAMS. So phase one, you start off with a small number of people, usually healthy volunteers, and sometimes people with a disease or condition like some peptides terminal people. Length of a study can be all up to a couple of months. What's the purpose of these studies? Safety and dosage, okay? Are that whatever whatever's being examined in a clinical trial, is it safe, number one? And also, can we get any kind of idea on dosage, recommended dosage? How much is supposed to be given per kilogram of body weight, for example, and age distribution and uh, gender distribution for any given potential uh, pharm pharmaco uh, pharmacological agent? So study participants uh, in phase two, okay, now these don't necessarily go one, two, three, four, but they normally go through this hierarchical pattern. Phase two, you get several hundred people. So you've jacked up now the N number, the number of people that are being examined. And this is usually with people that have a disease or condition. This isn't healthy people because you're not just looking, does this drug have an effect on, you know, your healthy uh uh, passers-by, but people that actually have some condition where this drug may be finding use, right, or utility. So the length of study can be several months, up to two years, so much longer. The purpose, again, is efficacy here. Does it work on this disease condition? And potential side effects. About 33% of all drugs move then from that phase two. So you see we're starting to decrease the number of drugs that make it through this these phases in clinical trials. We're narrowing, right, that doorway to let drugs even in to eventually get used into general use so that physicians, surgeons, and, and uh, other kinds of medical um, and healthcare people would consider prescribing it or suggesting it for their patients. Phase three, you get a lot more people, maybe up to 3,000. Again, these are all volunteers, obviously. Uh, they have to have the disease or the condition of the syndrome. The study is longer now, up to maybe four years. Again, this is all funded by the federal government, sometimes for pharmacology, pharmacology companies, pharmaceutical companies, excuse me. Purpose here again is efficacy. Does it work, right? Does it work considering like mode of action? And also a much more careful monitoring of adverse side effects. So maybe the drug works, maybe it's real good at killing uh, cancer cells in the pancreas, but maybe it also causes uh, cardiovascular disease. Maybe it causes brain disorders, right? So if we have these kind of severe adverse side effects, even though we might be having a very potent, efficacious compound for targeting, uh, we're not going to be following through beyond phase three with that because it's not going to be something you're going to want people to use unless the, the positives outweigh the negatives. And sometimes that is a decision. Finally, phase four, um, study participants can be in several thousands now, maybe tens of thousands. It can go worldwide. Uh, you do want to be looking at people with a disease. You don't want to be looking at healthy people here. You want to be looking at them, and you want to be doing a lot of comparison studies. Again, safety is really important because now you're looking at a bigger end number, so you're going to be able to get a larger idea of whether or not this is safe because of what. The more people you have, the more varied their disease is, Okay, because not every disease is the same. Even if you're at a certain stage of a certain cancer, it doesn't mean that you are going to have the same exact disease etiology as a person with the same stage of that cancer. Even if you're the same, if you're, if you're, if you're uh, the same sex or the same age, or even same ethnicity, people are all different in how the disease progresses, and the etiology of disease are all unique. So this is where the stuff really starts. Uh, hitting home. We start looking at larger numbers. We start seeing, are these compounds really safe? And do they really have efficacy in what we're trying to look at? Right? So let's see how the scrutiny of a clinical trials is quite thorough. Right? So clinical trials also, during this whole process, evaluate lots of things. So is the new compound or the new therapy on, or the, the new surgery, the new procedure, um, is it inferior against standard practice? If it is, well, what's the reason to really go forward? Well, because of outliers, maybe. You know, your standard chemotherapies, which like the, the platinum-based chemotherapies for cancer, um, they were not well tolerated. And they, in fact, killed a lot of people, particularly the elderly, the infirm, or people that have problems with their immune system. So, but those were frontline. Those are what we used as, uh, you know, what's out there. Then came taxanes and uh, other organic compounds that came in in the 90s that were used, again, as chemotherapeutics, but there's a lot of uh, lack of tolerance there. So 
not only do we have to look at this um, safety, we have to look at efficacy. Are the compounds that are coming on board, are they inferior to standard practice? If they are, who's going to prescribe them, right? Again, maybe for outliers that don't respond to standard practice. That's right. Um, also, are they superior to standard practice? If they are, well, then let's push everything out of the way, or at least let's bracket off some of that, set it aside a little bit. And let's say, okay, we've got a new kit on the block. It's a better drug. It really has high e efficacy. It has good safety. Like the, I'm thinking about immunotherapy right now, right? Uh, such as checkpoint uh, inhibitors, such as the uh, ones that affect uh, the PD and the PD ligand, right? Program death ligand. Those are um, becoming much more prominent, sometimes as first order um, therapies for certain forms of cancer, particularly when you're trying to get at primary cancers. Um, you also have to compare against placebo, of course. So if the placebo is about equal, you know, head to head with your new drug, even if it does seem to be superior uh, to standard practice, what is that saying? Saying, well, if it, placebo is performing as well, and people think they're getting this drug, then well, again, it has a lot to do with mind-body interaction. And that's something to consider. It doesn't mean it doesn't have efficacy. It just means there's another important component of it, which is largely a black box still uh, in science. Even though neuroscience has been advanced tremendously in our understanding of how the mind interacts with the body, and in fact, if they're just one thing, if the mind is just part of the body or vice versa, we still are at our infancy or very early childhood in understanding neurological interactions between what's going on in the brain, how that's interpreted to the, to the mind, how it's experienced. And that experience has a lot to do with whether or not drugs have efficacy. If you feel good about a drug you're taking, you're going to likely get better, right? This is something that's been shown again and again. So also, what else do clinical trials do? They have cohort analyses, okay? Let's look at only middle-aged black men in this study. Let's only look at um, 20 to 30-year-old white females in this other study. Why? Because those may be the people that have the prevalence of a given syndrome or a given disease, right? So you have cohorts that you study, and you separate them out. That's the whole idea of a randomized controlled trial, RCT. You're, you're trying to make cohorts, and you're trying to make those cohorts cohesive and coherent with each other. So you're trying to normalize the background genotype, epigenotype, gene expression level in people. Now that's not always the right way to go because then you're not looking at cross section You're not looking at drugs or therapies or procedures work across the spectrum of people. You're looking at people that have been selected because they have similarities, right? So you have to consider both of those, but still cohort analysis is real big. So we look at age, sex, genotype, uh, and then we do cross-section. Like I said, we want to look at a cross-section of population and cross-section is of course, is going to be uh, different from the randomized control trial, which is going to be using heavily cohorts, right? A lot of control in those studies. Um, there's also the concept in clinical uh, analyses of drugs and therapies on whether or not there is a temporal stability. Does whatever this treatment being offered on offer, does it persist? Does it have penetrance and potency? In other words, a person's on a 12-week or 12-month regime of something, and they're doing better, they're doing better. When they go off the drug, go off the therapy, you change the dosage, do they go back and do you get complete um, uh, uh, a disease, full-blown disease come back, right? So uh, this is really important. Do you, can you maintain a remission or can you get a cure of the disease, right? So we're looking at uh, uh, a patient, uh, who, patients who survive the treatment, right? So you want to have disease-free survival. If you can get disease-free survival from using some of these more uh, potent drugs. And, and that means that you, you end up with a patient that no longer is on the drug. That's really important as well. Also surrogate analysis, right? So you're looking at biomarkers. Can you use it a bio, can you look at a biomarker in the serum or in the urine, or maybe a punch biopsy in the skin and say, oh, every time this biomarker goes up or goes down or stays neutral or does things differently in different stages of the therapy. Ah, now we know the drug, let's say is efficacious, you see. Um, also, surrogate endpoints can be things like mortality, right? Um, many uh, cancer studies are how many people survive, right? So if people survive by this new treatment, what's the percent of them? 
What are the odds ratio that they're going to survive given this new treatment over a conventional treatment over, say, a placebo? But you can't even put on offer placebo because it's unethical, right? You might, in the middle of a clinical study, say, oh, this drug we're looking at, it's killing people. It's making people sick. Pull the drug. Pull the study. Buy study. Buy drug, right? Millions of dollars maybe just completely put on hiatus or never come or never recovered by the pharmaceutical companies or by the federal government or by both. So there's all this stuff that's really complicated in clinical trials. And it's good that it is because we're talking about human health, right? Not animal health. We're not talking about lab rats here. So I want to give you also this kind of general understanding of what we mean by the scientific method. Now I know that many of you think you know what it is, and I know that many of you scientists and physicians and medical healthcare people um, maybe scoff at it and say, well, who really does a scientific method? Well, I wouldn't say that we go down and we write down a list of now we go to the hypothesis, now we generate data, now the data informs us, now we got a new hypothesis. I don't know if we're writing this down in our lab notebooks like that, but we're certainly reasoning that way. So let's take a look at a closed loop con concept of how a research process might work. First of all, you start off with identifying a question. Okay, and again, you can jump into this loop any place, right? You identify a question like, say, I wonder what's causing um, this rash of uh, prefrontal dementia in middle-aged Asian men who have migrated to the U.S. Okay, a question like that, very specific. I just made that up, right? But I'm sure that there is a question like that out there somewhere in the medical community. So you start developing hypotheses. Well, let's take a look at their genotype. Let's take a look at what happened when they migrated. Let's take a look at their uh, 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 conditions before they moved. Let's take a look at their diet. Let's take a look at their um, exercise programs. Let's take a look at their job, right? We can start putting all these factors together, use reasoning skills, bring in whatever empirical data we have, and generate some hypotheses. Then we can develop a research plan, right? A research plan is all the experiments you're going to do. How are you going to do them? What are the controls? What kind of instrumentation do you need? What kind of expertise do you need? Do you need collaborators? Do you need specific lab equipment? Um, all, how long is it going to take? And of course, how much money is it going to take? And who's going to fund it? You finally then get to a point where you collect data. And then that data collection also is heavily scrutinized. You don't want to throw out outliers, but you don't want to take data that you know is flawed. So you want to be able to know the difference between good data and bad data. And you don't want to be subjective, although every human being is subjective. So that means that the objectivity in data collection sometimes is a critical component that people don't think about when they're not scientists. But when you collect data, you want, you want to feel that the data is authentic. It really is the result of what the instrument is measuring. It's a mass spectrometer looking at peptide expression in a muscle tissue, right? You want to make sure that what you're looking at is really authentic. So you want to be comparing that data maybe with someone else's mass spec or some entire different laboratory may have a different procedure, like let's say using a, um, a, a flow cytometry to back up something like a mass spectrometer data, right? Or maybe just looking at elect electrophoretic patterns or uh, ELISA's or Western blots. There's all kinds of things that have to be confirmatory in that data. That's simply, here's our data, and now we're going to interpretation. We have to make sure the data is good, right? So in other words, it's not evidence. So then we have to interpret. This, again, is a tremendous hurdle. We have to be able to look at our data and we have to reason through what does the data actually say. That means we have to be educated, well-educated, well-read in the scientific literature. We can't just look at the data and say, well, looks like A goes to B, therefore A causes B. Or A goes to B, but we don't know if A also goes to C or D. Or on the way to B, A goes to A1, A2, A3, and may divert back to A and maybe even inhibit A's activity. We don't know that unless we know a lot about what we're studying. So all along this procedure, we have to be the masters of the literature. We have to be well-read in it. We have to know what's going on. And from all of that, we can carry out a true analysis of the data and hopefully come up to an interpretation of it. From that analysis, from that interpretation, whole new questions may arise. In fact, you may totally 
swap out, get rid of, eliminate your original hypothesis. You may say, well, that hypothesis is obviously flawed. Or you might say, well, that hypothesis should be carried forward, but there are three more we just discovered. We got to follow those three too, because they could be competing or complementary to the original ideas. So, and all the time, still, we have your mainframe question, which becomes identified. And that's, again, the funding cycle. We got to keep going through this. We got to keep generating data. We, and that, again, is like in, in the stage four of those clinical trials, you got to get large numbers, large and larger numbers, because people are variable, right, in their phenotype. And because of that, their diseases are going to be variable. So again, going basic here, because I'm doing it for a reason. So I want you to be thinking about this. When you go to the internet, you're going to buy some complementary uh, uh, or alternative uh, medicine. I want you to think about how much really goes into it when you're buying a, an authentic medicine, okay? So I want you to know what research scientists like myself, what we really end up doing before it ever gets to the clinic or even a clinical trial before let alone it actually makes it to the hospital or to uh, you getting a prescription uh, at Walgreens. So there are three types of research questions. And, they're, you know, these are nuanced, okay? And these are just like general considerations here. They're descriptive, difference, and relationship. So let's take a look at those. I want you to be thinking about this. This is where, sci where science meets actual rational thought here, right? That's why it's important, not just empirical, you know, oh, let's collect data and see what it says. These kinds of things have to be considered. If not outright, they must be something somewhere in your consciousness as a scientist. So descriptive questions. The purpose is to describe phenomena or characteristics of a particular group of subjects being studied. So you want to look at what's there now. You want to describe it. So you can describe, for example, um, or a given organic compound, and how does that organic compound interact with a reaction cleft in an enzyme, for example. So if you're a person that works, if you're a, a rational drug designer and you're a chemist, you want to know, well, okay, there's a phenomenon out there that every time we have a benzoyl ring, it's going to find a specific um, interdigitation into this reactive site in this protein kinase. If the protein kinase has a uh, trimeric subunit structure, I mean, again, very specific, right? Well, then all you want to do in those early phases of a descriptive analysis, descriptive type of research, is just say, what's the phenomenon itself, right? All the way down to the very earthy, what's going on in the molten enzyme catalytic site, or what's going on when antibody meets antigen, What's going on when the T cell is activated? What kind of nutrition does the T cell have in order to be activated and become potent in a, in a, uh, a, a primary cancer in the pancreas or the liver, right? So those are descriptive questions, even though they're very basic science. They take a lot of work. Then there are difference type questions. You want to be able to compare things with, the, uh, 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 with each other and sometimes with disparate groups. So is there a difference? Is there a difference between, for example, when you're looking at a drug's efficacy between men and women? Does a drug work the same in uh, uh, older people, middle-aged people, younger people? Not just with dosage. Maybe there's something also to do with the fact that the different aging process means different immune responses. And we know that's the case, right? Again, I've talked about this often in some of my previous lectures. This, this whole general understanding that we think we comprehend in science is really not what's there. What we have is a lot of individual, specific, patient-by-patient -patient interactions. And the only way we really pull that out where that can be examined is by asking difference questions, okay? So again, how is it done at the experimental level? Treatment versus control, right? You got to have controls. What does the control do? Well, you have to have positive controls and you have to have negative controls. Again, I think most of you understand what that is. Positive control is every time you use that control, it gives you the result that you can study, that you can monitor, that you can take to the bank. It's going to give you enough uh, absorbance in the spectrophotometer. It's going to give you a large enough peak on a mass spec or a GC or a GC mass spec uh, or an HPLC trace or, or on a gel or for a blot uh, or in a cell sorter, right, for signal. Any of these kinds of data, you want to be able to say that you can compare a positive control each time and say, yep, that always works in this treatment. Uh, and so what is our now unknown doing, right? Likewise, you want a negative control. You want to be able to look at a, 
uh, type of cell or a type of compound or a nuanced array of how things are working in the test tube, what's added, what's not added, reducing agents, buffering agents, salts, uh, detergents, you name it, and how that causes a difference. And sometimes what you're looking for is the negative control. When you add this, you never get the result. And you want to make sure that you're not getting false positives, you see. So, so you have to come up with that. Someone has to come up with all of these positive negative controls. And that's all part of the experimental design, right? And even goes all the way back to how you're generating hypotheses because you have to know whether or not, I've got this great idea, but boy, how am I going to control for all these variables? You can't control for them at the lab bench right there in the microfuge tube. Probably not going to get very meaningful data, right? So it's very specific at the very early stages of research. You also have to look at pre and post test comparisons. Does the, for example, the subjects have they changed over the period of time you've been doing this, say, this, this drug discovery, this uh, drug efficacy study? You're in a type two uh, clinical trial, phase two clinical trial. And you're saying, well, are these safe? Are these efficacious? Well, let's say that this is over a two year period, which can go that long. And maybe your, um, your group, your cohort group, maybe something has happened that two year period with a certain percentage of them. Maybe some of them have uh, had a lot of uh, indigestion. Maybe they've developed uh, two or three different uh, um, seasonal flus, right? Is that going to affect, is that going to impact on your study? Very well good, right? And then there's whole non-experimental research. Compare one group to another based on existing characteristics, okay? That's just like more like an epidemiological study, and those sometimes are very valuable. Finally, relationship questions. To investigate the degree to which two or more variables co-vary or indeed associate with each other. This comes down to, are these actually correlated? You can ask, for example, biomarker studies, surrogate studies. You can also ask whether or not every time we see that there's an increase in this trace, uh, like the long QT in heart disease, does that always suggest that there's going to be out there in the future a myocardial infarction or some kind of ischemic event, right? So, those are the kinds of things you have to look at. What varies, what does not co-vary. You have to get a lot, you have to get uh, pretty serious about your mathematics and your statistics. And you have to be able to pull out false positives and false negatives. And that has, again, a lot to do with numbers, crunching numbers. You have to see whether or not, therefore, if the variables are related or if there isn't any variable relationship. And it's usually not to look at cause and effect because really studying causality is not possible because causality is what you already bring into anything you do as a human. Your, your brain is wired to see cause and effect. So you can't say, well, does this, is A cause B? Because you already are presuming there is a cause to B. So if you have something which is <laughs> uh, being studied and, and you say, well, look, whenever I add this, I get this result. You want to jump to the conclusion that it causes it, but it may not cause it. It may have some pleiotropic, complex, multi-nodal, uh, multivariant effect that somehow gives you that result in the small sample size you have, but not a cause, right? So that's a very difficult thing. So I like to think that most of science is actually relational. Or what I mean by that, you get correlations, right? Very seldom do you get so-called proof. Okay, so sorry for all that background, but I want you to think about that because CAMs, Okay, complementary and alternative medicines, they don't go through all of that intense scrutiny. Okay, even though people are aware of it, the people that are looking at CAMs by and large are vendors, or you're getting a folk medicine sort of activity. Not to say there's anything wrong with folk medicine, but you're not getting what I just described to you. That's the point I'm making. Okay? So, <clears throat> brand new Blue Scorpion study published this year in Scientific Reports. And there's your website. It's a free paper, so you can go right to it and you can read the paper yourself. So what is this paper going to talk to us about? It now, here we get down to the nitty-gritty. Go back all the way to the reason I'm wearing blue today is because we're talking about blue scorpions. So is blue scorpion venom valuable in cancer therapy? Question one, okay? Commercially prepared. Okay, so it's already out there. So this study is saying, well, somebody's already selling these peptides. The venom has been purified to, I think, five peptides, right? Peptides are, again, short proteins, right? Um, is that commercially prepared compound, originally it was called Escazul, right? 
uh, from Mexico and from Cuba uh, is from the venom of the rare blue scorpion. That's Ropalurus juncius, okay? And that particular rare blue scorpion is not like any blue scorpion, of which there are a lot, apparently, like there's ones in Asia. And by the way, the images I used there at the beginning, I tried to find the rare blue scorpions. I hope I did, right? I'm relying on my uh, uh, search engine that it did actually give me that. At any rate, the one we're talking about is indigenous to Cuba. Right? It's not the blue scorpions you get in, uh, for example, uh, the Republic of Vietnam. There is a Cuban company, in fact, called Labia Farm, and it's registered the product in homeopathic formula formulations, and they call it Vitatox 30CH. Okay, that's what they sell it as. And you can get this, I think, probably just by searching for it online and ordering it, right? I don't think you can go to uh, your King Supers or your Walgreens or your Safeway Pharmacy and find this on the shelf. I haven't really looked, but I kind of doubt it because it's probably pretty expensive and pretty rare. But who knows? Maybe if you're in one of these upscale um, pharmacies in downtown Chicago, maybe you would find this on the shelf. I don't know. Certainly, I've seen it's online. Anyway, this compound or this, this formulation is in 33% ethanol. Okay, so it's in a really high ethanolic solution. So does ethanol have an effect if you ingest this uh, material? Uh, yeah, ethanol does have an effect uh, on the body. Now, so Escazil supposedly contains, okay, this, this the commercial product is called Vitatox, five low molecular mass peptides. And these researchers looked at these peptides. So people have actually looked at this, purified them, done mass spectral analysis on them, compared them, comparison studies of other peptides and other scorpion venoms. So that's why they even knew that peptides may be the biologically active agent in the rare blue scorpion here. Okay, So we're not talking about something that has no history, no scientific history. In fact, in some ways, that can even be more problematic. Someone has studied this. But again, what is the potency of the study? How many studies have been done? What's the veracity of the study? Can we verify the evidence, right? Because something is published doesn't mean that we know everything we need to know about it. Certainly because even though something is published about it, we have these peptides that seem to be components of this blue scorpion venom that has all this great efficacy, supposedly. It doesn't mean it's been tested through all of the vagaries of clinical research files and preclinical like I just described to you. So Vitatox, according to their claim, was previously tested on more than 10,000 cancer patients with positive results, ranging from an improved quality of life, whatever that is, that looks like qualitative. I mean, there's the word right in the phrase, right? Not quantitative, improved quality of life to a slowing of tumor growth. Slowing of tumor growth can mean a lot of things. What kind of tumors? Where is this seen? And again, I looked for this study. Where is the study that's got 10,000 cancer patients? Where were the randomized controlled trials? Guess what? They don't exist. This is a claim. They don't exist. So none of this, since this was never really tested, none of this is verified. This is not evidence even. Okay. There it is. Okay. There apparently is the compound that's being sold by this Cuban company. Okay. Vitatox. All right, so what is the evidence? What evidence was I able to find? And there wasn't much. Here's a paper that was published in the Journal of Venom Research, uh, published again in, uh, looks like about four years ago, June of 2013. There's the citation. In vitro anti-cancer effect of venom from the Cuban scorpion, okay, against a panel of human cancer cell lines. A panel of cancer cell lines. This is not the 10,000 people study. It doesn't exist, okay? All right, from this abstract, right, and I looked at the paper too, of course. The effect, and I, I put a quotation because these are basically rearranged from the abstract. The effect of a range of scorpion venom concentrations, and they just chose 0.1 to 1 milligram. I don't know where they got the idea that this was a good dosage. And these are concentrations, but it's not like per kilogram body weight. So this isn't a real... Um, uh, pharmacological study, right? We don't know what the dose is per kilogram of body weight to the person. We're just giving you, these are the concentrations that were used. And throughout the paper, I couldn't find anything about that. 
And they were using it as a panel of human tumor cell lines, not human beings, not animals at all. And the cell lines were epithelial, hemopoietic origins, and normal cells. So at least they had a control of normal cells. So that looks like, that's good. Okay, we're looking at normal cells. Um, the effect of the venom on tumor cell death was also assay. So that's the basic thing. Does it kill tumor cells? Apparently, they think that these peptides are going to kill the tumor cells. Specifically, well, I don't know about that, okay? Especially when you think about the mode of action of these, which I'll talk about momentarily. Only the epithelial cancer cells showed significant cell viability reduction. So only one of the uh, 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 two different forms of tumor cell lines, they had epithelial and hemopoietic tumor cells, Okay, these were already tumor cells. Only one type of them, uh, the epithelial cells, showed any efficacy. Okay, uh, There was no effect on normal. So they're saying safety was okay. But when they say no effect, and these are cells, who knows if they're safe in an animal model or let alone a human, right? Um, okay. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be any effect on hemopoietic tumor cells. So right away, there's got to be some specificity there. In most sensitive tumor cells, the scorpion venom induced what they call necrosis. Now, necrosis is an apoptosis. Necrosis is just cell death, de cell damage, right? Just oxidative damage. It doesn't have a programmed cell death orientation. In other words, a lot of drugs, when they go through an apoptotic pathway, it's usually better because a necrosis means that the cell contents leak out. What happens when you call necro cause necrosis, let's say, in a cancer environment? You're going to leak out of all those dying cells a whole host of antigens. You're going to induce a hyperimmune response from that, which can cause inflammation. The inflammation, if it goes uncontrolled, um, can lead to what? Eventually can lead to either programmed cell death you know, massive killing if you have a good population, for example, of natural killer T cells in there, or if those T cells are no longer functioning, you can actually get cell proliferation, right? So in other words, you induce this necrosis, you, in, you turn on an immune response, and you end up causing cancer, okay? So necrosis is not a good endpoint, not a good endpoint. All right, they concluded that the scorpion venom possessed a selective and differential toxicity against epithelial cancers. Of course, they say selective because it didn't have any effect on hemopoietic. And they're saying it was toxic as it caused necrosis. Even if that is valid, and I'm not saying it is, uh, because of the dosing and the small way the, 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 the way the study was done, um, rather insignificant number of experiments were performed. As again, it's just done on a panel of cells in culture. Um, it, it doesn't say that it's selective and differential and toxic. Okay? So even this paper, I don't think against the paper, it just it doesn't really, it doesn't. I can't verify what evidence they claim they interpret. Put it that way. Okay. Now here's a paper from Toxicon a year earlier, 2011. Here we're looking at traces for um, sodium voltage gated channels. Why are we looking at sodium voltage gated channel data? It's because scorpion venoms disturb the sodium voltage gated channel. Now, I'm not going to go into the whole study of what voltage gated channels do. I did talk about that in a couple previous lectures. Suffice it to say, it has to do with how cells uh, signal to one another, and that signaling allows for transmission of uh, bioactive current and biological material at whatever kind of cellular synapse you're looking at. So if you're looking at sodium voltage gated channels, you could be associating that with nutrient uptake. You could be associating that with uptake of um, antiviral uh, compounds like antibodies. You could be talking about uptake of entire cell masses into that cell type. So sodium voltage gated channels have a tremendous array of biological activity. They're not something that is easily tweaked and it's not usually a target uh, unless it's a very specific, say, specific subunit of a specific sodium voltage gated channel on a specific cell type. Then maybe you're talking about something that could be used as a drug. Anyway, what they said, what the venom did here, and you can see this shift here, there's the venom and there's the recovery after the venom has been washed out. The venom generated what's called a left shift on sodium voltage gated channels. That's known as a beta effect. And it was a delay in an inactivation kinetic, which is called the alpha effect. So remember, you have 
in single transduction pathways, you have in so sodium vo and voltage gated channels in general, you have a polarization of the membrane. That's what you're studying here. So you need to go from a certain polarity of the membrane, a certain, say, electronegativity, to a change in that polarity or electronegativity so that you change what the membrane is able to do in terms of transport or conveyance of a signal. Okay, so that's why this is so important. And that's what we were saying here. Integral membrane voltage-gated sodium channels act as gatekeepers. Okay? And there's they what do they keep, right? What, what are they gating? Selected permeation, in this case, of sodium ions, and thus are essential for the generation of an action potential in excitable cells. And the action potentials, again, control all the biological activity across that membrane. And everything about cell-cell communication has to do with an action potential of some kind. Chemical action potential or an electrical action potential. Scorpion venoms in general, not just this rare Cuban blue scorpion, disturb the excitability of those action potentials. That's what, how they function. That's what they do. So besides this effect, this venom is also shown, according to this paper, to have a, a disruptive effects not just on sodium channels, but on potassium channels. And also it has a weak phospholipase activity. Now, I'm not going to get into why that's kind of interesting, but phospholipases will allow for the release of fatty acids, usually from the number two position, because phospholipase A2 is the one that normally they're talking about here for PL uh, activity. And phospholipase A2 activity will release fatty acids that can go on to become very potent prostanoids or icosanoids, um, such as the uh, prostaglandins, the leukotrienes, for example. So releasing a fatty acid from the two position of a phospholipid via phospholipase triggers an autocrine paracrine event, which can then lead to things like inflammation. Okay. So in general, venoms, the snake venom does this too. In fact, snake venom has a very potent phospholipase A2 activity. Okay. So back to our paper that we want to talk about. Okay. Again, published about a couple months ago in Inside uh, Reporter. If they evaluated the effects of Vitatox, okay, that's the compound they got from the company, right, in hepatocellular carcinoma, because remember that thing that was said, 10,000 people did better with this, right? So Vitatox in their hands didn't aid in cell necrosis. It actually induced cancer cell proliferation both in vitro and in vivo in animal models. So this study showed not only did Vitatox not have a positive effect on HCC, it had a very negative effect, meaning it promoted the disease. Okay? So in their hands, Vitatox promoted the disease. And let's take a look at just a little bit of the data. I promised myself I wouldn't do a lot of data today because I want to make this as short as possible. My last bear I've met was criticized a little bit because it was a little long. I thought it was just right, but I'm trying to make this shorter. So just a little bit of data. And it's, it's the data I think that's relevant here. It's days after treatment on the, the x-axis. This is the uh, major different uh, differential diameter, okay? So what you want to see here is you want to see a decrease in the diameter of the cell mass of the cancer cells, right? So here is serafinib. Serafinib is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It is a actual therapeutic that's been used. It's kind of a new line. Tyrosine, protein tyrosine kinase inhibitors are being used in hepatocellular carcinoma, also in renal carcinoma, and also in non-small cell lung carcinomas. At any rate, basic pancreatic cancer too. Anyway, this is what you want to see. This drug, this would be now standard practice, caused a decrease in cell mass. You're decreasing the proliferation of the cancer cell mass, right? Here, you, your control, you see a steady increase, okay? Because these are cancer cells, they're continuing to increase. Look what happens when you add uh, Vitatox. You get a big increase, a statistical increase here in proliferation of the cancer cells, okay? Way out for days after treatment in the animal model. Same thing is shown here. The, uh, this is looking at labeling index. So that means the more cells you're making, you're labeling them up. And the Vitatox gives you more cells. It's statistically significant. That's what the asterisk means. So again, in their hands, in cell culture and in the animal model, what you're getting is a proliferation of cancer cells with Vitatox. The absolute opposite of what their claim is. Okay. So... 
Let's take a look now at serafinib. I wanted you to understand this. It's like I'm doing a comparison study from the literature. This is what I do. This is what I do. If you come and you ask me to look at, let's say, a complementary drug that you're considering to take, right? This is the kind of thing. I'm not going to just tell you that study. I want to look at what is the standard of care? In fact, what indeed was a specific drug that was used in that specific study? And what do we see about it? Okay. Now, I chose this paper. There are a lot of other papers I could have chose, but I want to show you there's some negative aspect of serafinib. Why am I showing you that? Because that's why people look for complementary and alternative medicines, because it doesn't always work, and sometimes it it has, it, it doesn't, it has so many undesirable effects, it's not even used. Right? But remember, this drug has gone through years and years and years of scrutiny, and it does have efficacy, right? But here's like a worst-case scenario, or like, Here's where its, its efficacy is not so profound that everybody that's taking it is getting cured of hepatocellular carcinoma. That's why I chose the paper. Published in The Oncologist in May of 2016. So you live over a year ago. They had 1,500 patients. They took 27% of them and they gave them serafinib. And they dosed it. They did all the right kind of experiments for this. Median duration was for 60 days. That's not a bad amount of uh, pharmacotherapy, 60 days, two months in. You should have an effect by then. They were looking at median survival. That was their endpoint from the first prescription. And it was three months when they gave this drug, serafinib, and it was two months for untreated. So the people got a 33% increase in median survival. So you might say, well, wow, that's amazing. But again, it's only one extra month of life. Now, that might not be significant to someone who's healthy, might not be someone who's uh, significant, even if you're not healthy, if you think you only get another month for this drug. But during that month of treatment, your disease etiology may have changed in different ways. So that maybe now it can be targeted with, let's say, uh, an immune therapy, right? Maybe you can go after it with uh, uh, an anti-PD or anti-PD-L1. And maybe now, because you've, you've softened it up with serafinib, right? Maybe you can go in with now a different drug or maybe with some radiation, maybe even with some conventional uh, chemotherapy or chemo radiation combined. And you might be able to kick that cancer way down because you softened it up with this anti-tyrosine kinase compound. So see, and you gain that extra month, right? So don't look at this as a negative, even though I'm trying to portray it as like, well, maybe it's not so great. But this is what happens when you're looking at cancer data and with patients, real people. Serafinib was associated with a non-significant, and that's important to researchers, reduction in mortality at three months. So just looking at the three-month period, 44% versus 51%, but there was no reduction thereafter. So once you stretch this out, this compound in this study, now these are advanced stage hepatocellular carcinoma patients, advanced stage. These are people that are dying, okay? They're ready for palliative care hospice, okay, down the road very soon. Probably they've they're certainly not drug naive. They've probably taken a lot of other drugs, a lot of other therapies, and they're just trying to test whether or not serafinib at this late stage for advanced stage cancer is having any effects. It's a very verified group, but they exist. Look, there are 1,500 patients they found, right? Not the other 75% of the people are getting something else, another arm of the study. Early primary cancers, early, these are not early, may benefit more from serafinib and similar targeted drugs than the metastatic disease. Remember, when you have, we're not talking about primary tumor anymore in the cancer, but you're talking about metastatic disease, totally different disease, right? The, the cancer is everywhere. It's in the blood. It's in maybe the brain. Maybe it's in the lungs by now. It's in uh, the pancreas. It's in the kidney. It's in the bladder, right? So trying to look at the results just in the liver, where maybe the primary lesion was, or maybe that's where it metastasized to. So it's a totally different cancer from origin basis. Uh, then the drug's going to have a different efficacy. Okay, So serafinib has a better um, profile when you look at primary early stage cancers, of course. That's why it's still used. So serafinib, what is it? I wanted you to know that what kind of compound it is. 444-chloral-3, trifluoromethylphenol, carbamylamino, phenoxy, and methylpyridine to carbox, carboxamide. Okay, now, if you tear apart what that structure looks like, you're going to see really important key here. It's got a lot of fluorine. Now, fluorine is probably one of the major reasons this drug has such potency, right? It's a very toxic, inorganic ion. I just want you to notice this is a fluoridated compound.
And it's interesting to me. And sometimes I'd like to spend time just giving you short talks on uh, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of different drugs. I want to do mode of action. I want to do some of those kinds of lectures. So I don't want to like neglect when I bring up a drug, I want to give you the real name of it. Now, maybe more importantly here, what does it do? First of all, it's a small molecule and has a really big name. Uh, and it inhibits protein tyrosine kinases. What kind of protein tyrosine kinases? The kind that become mutated in hepatocellular carcinoma. And not just that cancer, but here we're talking primarily here. So VEGFR, that's the receptor, PDGFR, CRAF, and BRAF. So those are all tyrosine kinases, and this drug is targeting them, mutated forms of them that you pick up in the cancer, right? Because of problems with DNA damage, by the way. Maybe. So let's not think negatively. Let's move away from the buscorpion toxin, which didn't seem to do well. In fact, it did poorly. Let's not worry about serafinib only, although it does have some effect, that 33% increase. Let's look at all the other conventional drugs and therapies that are out there right now in uh, late summer 2017. You've got PD-1 and PDL one monoclonal antibodies. I've talked about these in other lectures. I'm not going to go over what they are. But that's the new immunotherapy. They're using a whole array of cancers, and they're working pretty well. Generally speaking, about a 33% efficacy. That's pretty good. Uh, you also have this whole host of tyrosine kinase inhibitors. You just saw one, serafinib. Um, and those are two prominent 21st century pharmacotherapeutics, and they show decent efficacy, much better and much better safety, uh, much less tissue damage than your old-fashioned platinum-based chemotherapeutics or even your uh, taxanes uh, and your antifolates, right? So these drugs are much more benign to the body, although what can they cause? Now, for example, these monoclonal antibodies, I knew I wasn't going to say it, but I'm going to tell you anyways. What they do is they turn on the T-cells. T cells are being inhibited because the cancer cell is inhibiting them by targeting the program death receptor, which kills the T cells. When you use a program death ligand uh, inhibitor or program death receptor inhibitor, what you're doing is you're returning on, you're turning the switch back on to uh, those T cells. When you turn them back on and they're invading and infiltrating into that uh, cancer in the liver, they're going to all of a sudden start killing the cancer. They're going to do what they're supposed to. So one of the things cancers do is they evade the immune system. They don't just evade it, they destroy it, right? And so these PD-1 and PDL one and other such immunotherapies turn up the immune response. So why can that be dangerous? You can get what? And a lot of inflammation. That's Those are the itises, right? Like pancreatitis, hepatitis. Those you can control sometimes with corticosteroids. Now, if it goes beyond that, you get autoimmune disease as a backdrop to using these, then you're in real trouble. So you can't let that happen, right? So they're not without their flaws, but they are much cleaner drugs than what they were using, much cleaner drugs than your dad or your granddad were using in the 80s and 90s. So included in this armamentarium are protease inhibitors. That's another whole class of drugs being used in cellular carcinoma. DNA damage repair inhibitors try to block DNA damage repair. Um, DNA damage can sometimes induce mutations. Sometimes if you inhibit the repair, the cancer cells get so sick, they die. They can't repair their DNA. Like they senesce out, right? Or they apoptose, right? Uh, you get a combination, a whole host of combinations of these therapies where the introduction of the drug is also, so the temporal introduction, uh, the sequence of that introduction, the hierarchy of that introduction, the dosage of that introduction is coordinated not just with what disease is in general or the stage of the disease, but the patient's genotype and indeed the patient's epigenotype. By that, I'm just talking about gene expression, which is where everything's really moving to now. Drugs that combat Pre-cancer state are also used for HCC. Let's try to get it before it starts. So there are antivirals against hepatitis C virus. Hepatitis C virus is an etiologic agent for HCC. Um, there's a condition, a genetic condition called hemochromatosis. And hemochromatosis is familiarly inherited. The lesion there is in hepcidin, which controls iron accumulation in the liver. You get too much iron accumulation in the liver, you get too much reactive oxygen species, you can induce hyperplasia, hepatocellular carcinoma, okay? That's unfortunately a direct effect. You get hemochromatosis because you have a deficiency in hepcidin, you get a buildup of iron, and boom, some small uh, group of those people end up with full-blown HCC. Some people die. 
Um, okay, so hepcidin modulation is also being looked at. Can we increase the amount of hepcidin in the liver? Can you get combined targeted chemo and radiation therapies? When to do the radio, when to do the chemo, when to do the immuno, when to do a protease inhibitor, when to do a DNA damage repair inhibition. All of these are being looked at by very careful clinical trials at various stages of phases. Okay. So those are all under strict federal guidelines, right? All the ones we just talked about, right? All those trials are really significant. So the general recommendation by the medical community after considering all of this is avoid CAMs. Avoid CAMs when you're looking at HCC. Why? Because your basic physician, your basic surgeon, your basic oncologist is not going to be reading all these papers that may exist or not. They're just going to think, I want to not worry about my patients taking CAMs because I do know that CAMs can be potent and they can be detrimental. Right? At the same time, though, you have, a pa- you have a patient come into your office and they may say, well, I found out that this blue scorpion venom is really good. And I'm, you know, I know that my chemotherapy or my immunotherapy is, seems to be working. But what if I add this as another ingredient? Well, now, maybe if you're a physician, you might say, well, you know what? I heard this YouTube from this uh, Dr. Guerra and he showed me a paper that showed that not only do I think you uh, should reconsider, I really don't think you should take blue scorpion venom for uh, your therapy now that we're working on your hepatocellular carcinoma. That's definitely what I would uh, take as uh, evidence, and I certainly would not want to um, ever recommend that, that that blue scorpion venom for this, given that one paper. Now, we may find out a thousand papers later that, in fact, there is some efficacy for the scorpion venom, but right now, no way. Right? Uh, always err on the side of caution. So the blue scorpion venom paper is a recent example of why there's skepticism and downright, you know, uh, dis, uh, discouragement to look at CAMs, right? There's a lot of concern, and that's why basically most physicians don't want to talk about them. Sometimes that's off-putting to the patient, right? especially if it comes from a cultural background. So what's my final analysis? What's Dr. Guerra's final analysis here? Let's be general, but let's also be even, okay? I don't have a... Uh, dog in this, uh, out of a dog in this hunt, out of a horse in this race. I really want to know if CAMs work. So CAMs need to be well examined before rational and responsible recommendations can be made for the use. When I'm saying rational and responsible, I'm just saying right now, today, can we reason and be responsible and say, yeah, why not try this? How could it hurt? I'd say we haven't examined them well enough except for the rare instances with something like resveratrol that has been in careful study for a long time, or originally the taxanes, right, which were at one time a plant extract, okay? Uh, Those have been well vetted. But by and large, you know, 95, 98, 99% of the CAMs are not. Secondarily, CAMs are too chemically varied, right? There's way too many types of chemistries. Here we have peptides. You might have biphenols. You might have phenolic acids, which are different. You might have carbohydrates. You might have fatty acids. You might have fatty alcohols. You might have cholestines. You might have any number of different organic compounds or inorganic compounds or salts uh, or combination thereof uh, that are CAMs. So too varied to simply reason intelligibly on what a vendor claims, right? So I don't care what the vendor says, just sitting in your armchair and just using your reasoning skills, your rational um, function, right? Your faculties of rationality, uh, you just can't follow that. There's no way that you can follow the uh, any of these testimonials, any of these vendor claims, and even the few papers that are out there. So more empirical work is absolutely necessary here. So for me, my final analysis is that's another big uh, nail in the coffin of just going out and using CAMs for something really, uh, any, any kind of disease state. Finally, CAMs may be useful. Who knows? Okay. I mean, the, the jury is out, right, in the long term because we don't have evidence, enough evidence. But they have to be examined on a case-by-case basis. They have to be. And if you use evidence-based bench level and preclinical as animal studies and clinical, that means all phase trials, and you go through a hypothesis-driven research method, all of that long, horrible sentence, you go through all that scrutiny that all your normal pharmaceuticals go through and your conventional therapies and procedures go through, then maybe they will be useful, or at least we'll know which ones are and which ones aren't. 
and we'll know something about dosing and efficacy and mode of action and all that. So that's a, we're not there yet, and we're far from there. Even though some money is being thrown at these CAMs, not enough to be able to deal with the entire um, pseudo pharmacopoeia that's out there on your uh, uh, pharmacy shelf or on the internet, right? All right, so I'm done, finally. Sorry it took as long as it did. I tried to make it short, but I, hopefully I did something of service. We talked about a specific complementary and alternative medicine, medicine in quotation marks, right? And what was that? That was this blue scorpion venom. Uh, what we, what I determined by looking at the literature, by looking at some key papers and trying to find positive and negatives is that is not a good agent. That is not a good player. It's not the kind of thing that uh, any reasonable person would want to be uh, putting in their body. Okay. So this is the kind of stuff we do at Med. We can go ahead and take a look at any of these possible agents for you. We can do an in-depth study using scientific literature, and we can uh, discuss with our clients wherever you want to go with that. If it's a physician or if it's a, uh, an individual layperson or if it's a clinic, uh, that's what we're here for. So please contact us at info at verifmed.com or visit our website. Again, I'm Dr. Dan Guerra. You will deal with me directly. I will be the person that will be responding to you and we'll move forward. Remember what Med is, right? We're scientists verifying published evidence in biochemical, physiological, pharmacological, and in general medical sciences. This was just a small vignette of the kinds of things we do. Again, this is simply a video lecture. What we do for our clients is much more. We go much more in depth. We really talk about the data. And we, again, we grow together in what we want to be able to study uh, and, and uh, examine so that it comes up with a cli client-based, what, what our function is here. So thanks a lot uh, for your attention, and um, uh, hope, hopefully you will have a great uh, weekend. Take care.